And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call. As tonight, your Indiana Hoosiers defeat Jacksonville 94-64 at Simon Scott Assembly Hall in a game that completes the non-conference portion of Indiana's schedule and in a game that featured a little bit of history with Jawan Morgan notching the second triple-double in school history with a terrific performance that we will talk about as we go through this show. I am your host, Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, and we will break down all of tonight's action for you on this edition of the Assembly Call postgame show. But first, we were saddened, as all of you were earlier this week, to learn about the passing of legendary IU beat writer Terry Hutchins. Ryan spoke some heartfelt words about his personal experience with Hutch on Thursday's edition of Assembly Call Radio. And we just want to say right off the top of the show tonight how much we appreciated Hutch's work covering IU basketball over the years, how much we learned from him, and how much he will be missed. To his wife, to his sons, to all those who were close to him, we want you to know that you are in our thoughts tonight and moving forward this holiday season, and we wish you peace during this difficult time. Over at Inside the Hall, Alex compiled a post full of personal anecdotes from past and present members of the IU Beat who shared their memories of working with Hutch. Highly recommend uh, that you read that. Well worth the read. And I felt that this line from Rick Bozich summed it up the best. He said, quote, His passing leaves a hole in the IU journalism world, but he left us all with a smile and a blueprint for how to treat other people and do our work. We can all honor him best by remembering it, unquote. Rest in peace, Hutch. We dedicate this show to you. All righty, let's proceed now as we start every show, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And look, obviously in a game where a guy gets a triple-double, seven minutes and 50 seconds to go, Jawan Morgan notches that triple-double. He only needed a bucket. He had already gotten the assist, already gotten the rebounds. He only needed two more points to get it. He got it out of, off of a really nicely designed out-of-bounds play underneath the basket. Uh, but what I want to talk about, you know, that, that obviously is the moment that really sticks out. But, you know, I want to talk about the assist because I thought the story of tonight's game was Juwan's passing. And, and I thought an even more meaningful moment than that, because, you know, when Juwan gets a triple double, the game has already decided Indiana's up by 20 some points. But if you think back all the way to the first half, you know, a little bit of a sluggish start for Indiana. Uh, and Jacksonville went on an 8-0 run at one point in the first half to take a 14 to 9 lead. And I think a lot of Indiana fans are kind of thinking, oh boy, here we go again. And what Indiana did at that point is they went to the to their bread and butter. And in this game, and as it's been all season, that bread and butter was playing through Juwan in the post. And he responded without scoring a point. He assisted on two of Indiana's next three baskets, one to a cutting Romeo Langford. Uh, then on a subsequent possession, he found Al Durham on the opposite wing. Al put Indiana ahead 18 to 14, and the Hoosiers never really looked back. And that was the story of the first half. Juwan's passing. He had five assists. He had four great ones out of the post. And then he had that Magic Johnson style one handed bounce pass and transition that was awesome. And so, you know, with Indiana again shorthanded, no Zach McRoberts, no Rob Finnessy tonight, they needed their most reliable player to be their rock early on. And Juwan was exactly that. He was really good from the get go, played well the entire night. And so it was great to see that effort culminated with history, with getting that triple double later in the game. So hats off to you, Juwan, for another terrific performance. All right, tonight's Hoosier Proud banner moment, as always, brought to you by our friends at Hoosier Proud and Home Field. At homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel anywhere. I've told you all about the tri-blend sweatshirt with the old IU Bison logo that I love, but they also have many other sweatshirts and t-shirts with old IU logos that you can't find anywhere else, so it's worth a look. And at HoosierProud.com, you can still find great state of Indiana-themed apparel while sending 10% of your purchase to causes around Indiana like the Julian Center for Empowering Survivors of Domestic Abuse. Both brands were started by an IU grad, and all Hoosier Proud and Home Field Apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. Find the perfect gift for the IU fan or Indiana resident in your life at Home Field Apparel and HoosierProud.com. Can a brother get some coupons? Yes. Don't forget to use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout for 15% off your order on either site. That's promo code ASSEMBLY at HoosierProud.com and HomeFieldApparel.com. All right. Well, it is time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. Tonight, that is Andy Bottoms. Andy, your bottoms line on this dominant Indiana victory. I mean, certainly you have to start with Juwan and and those that stretch you mentioned in the first half was one of a few that that really stood out to me. Um, you know, coming off of falling down fourteen to nine, as you said, IU scored on eight of the next nine possessions and really took control of the game back over. And then at the end of the half, they scored on I think six of the last seven. 
and uh, and much to everyone's delight, came out in the second half, uh, apparently ready to really uh, kind of drop the hammer uh, on Jacksonville, scored on six of the first seven possessions again there and only gave up one point over Jacksonville's first 10. So for those uh, long awaiting a, uh, a positive start to a half and a quick start to a half, the second half was it. And I thought that really, you know, put the game away. And, and it's one of the things in a game that you kind of knew was going to end up as a blowout, but but one that you, you know, you kind of look and what, how has this team improved? And I thought that was at least one way where they really jumped on them early and, and took away any chance of, uh, of them really being in the game from that point forward. And then from that point, it was really just the triple double watch was the, uh, was pretty much the only drama left in the game. And uh, yeah, pretty impressive to, uh, it, it was kind of like needing a, a basket uh, to make the triple double is kind of like a guy needing a single to hit for the cycle in baseball. It felt like it was like, how in the world does this not happen yet? I, it was surprising to me. They didn't have 10 points. Cause really in the first half, every time they went to him, he just seemed like he could score whenever he wanted. So he was five maybe- for five. I saw a stat that he hasn't missed a two point field goal. I think since the Louisville game, which is insane. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So it did, it did kind of feel like on the flip side, it was like, well, this is, if there's anything left that he needs to do, like that's going to be the easiest one for him to get. And you kind of felt like he could score. So I think the timing worked out well. They could have that timeout, draw up a good inbounds play. Uh, I think Jess Settles talked about they'd worked a lot on, uh, on baseline out of bounds situation. So maybe that was one they had worked on uh, at the shoot around today and were able to get him that and then get him out of the game and get him some rest. Yeah, and I also thought it was impressive early on how he defended without fouling. I mean, he had all three. I mean, for a while there, a very short while early in the game, it was kind of a quadruple double watch, you know, because he had those three blocks early on. And, you know, I thought for a little while after that, after that early stretch, he kind of started hunting blocks a little bit, you know, kind of coming over from the weak side, trying to block everything. But early on, you know, we've seen him struggle in some of those situations, pick up some early fouls. He did a really nice job of defending the basket. Because I thought one of the struggles for Indiana early on was they really weren't defending the ball screen actions by Jacksonville very well. And that was, you know, one of Archie's, em- you know, points of emphasis coming in. And I thought that, you know, the guards, Devontae Green, Al Durham did a better job of that um, later in the game. But they were kind of struggling with that. Jacksonville was, you know, getting the ball in around the rim. And Juwan did a nice job of cleaning that up without fouling. So just, you know, a terrific night from him. And it's it's just another example. I mean, obviously he can score. You know, we saw him put up 35 points against Butler, but he can impact the game in so many ways because, you know, the three blocks, the two steals, you know, those, those won't be talked about a lot when you got 10 points, 10 boards, and 10 assists, and you get a triple-double. But he was Indiana's rock tonight, and it was great to see. Um, you know, and look, you know, Jess Settles on the Big Ten Network broadcast, he was uh, he was sounding the horn for for Juwan as, a, you know, the one of the leaders for all conference. I saw... Earlier this week, did you see the USA Basketball Writers uh, midseason watch list for the Oscar Robertson Trophy, the Player of the Year Trophy, did not include Jawan Morgan? Uh, so, you know, not, not really a better response than the the second triple-double in school history to uh, to that ridiculous yeah, pretty, snub. Yeah, pretty amazing that, that that was only the second one in school history and that the first one came not with points, rebounds, and assists, but with points, rebounds, and block shots. So Steve Downing, 1971. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely a, a, a historic night for him. Good way to kind of end the non-conference season, give these guys a break. And, uh, yeah, like you said, a really solid all-around performance from him. Did a good job without fouling. And I think even the first foul that he got called for in the first half, I thought was debatable at best. There were, there were several debatable foul calls in this yeah. game, but that's oh, neither here nor there. You're a big guy that's standing with your arms straight up. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be a foul, sir. You're yeah. going to have to go sit down. So ridiculous. Um, still, You know, even though, you know, 30-point game – Maybe not too much to take from this, but I still feel like there's a lot of storylines and interesting things to cover. One of them being Al Durham, who set a career high with 18 points, uh, you know, really kind of got back to to doing the things that Al does when he's playing well. You know, he, he knocked down a few threes, you know, got some really nice uh, catch and shoot opportunities. Uh, one was assisted by Devontae Green in the first half. Juwan had that other one that I mentioned. And we also saw him get back to his bread and butter of going to the basket some. And I really like seeing that in the first half. Uh, he had a nice drive and finish. Uh, he ended up, uh, you know, with those 18 points, he had three other two-point field goals and was three or four from the free throw line, uh, you know, and then mixed in a few assists and a few rebounds too. On the negative side for Al, he had three of Indiana's 12 turnovers and he continues to have this bad combination of seeing passes that aren't there and then really tentatively, awkwardly delivering them. And it's one of those things, like if you're going to kind of try and create an angle for a pass, you've really got to make that pass and he'll kind of see something that's not there and try and float it over. And it just... He just seems to be a little out of rhythm on some of the, you know, what he's kind of creating for other people, but he did a nice job of being patient and creating for himself tonight offensively. And so I thought this was a nice bounce back game for him. 
Jacksonville is not the type of team that presents the challenges that we've talked about that he faces sometimes with more athletic, more physical teams. But, you know, with Indiana really needing to lean on him, especially with Rob Finnessy out of the game, it was nice to see him step up, score those points, and hopefully that's something that he can take forward from a confidence perspective with Big Ten play starting. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that 18 points can be quiet, I felt like he had a quiet 18. Like, I was surprised that that's what the final, you know, box score really showed. Um, you know, even though he did have 12 in the first half, even the first half, you know, there were certainly moments where he played well. Uh, I felt like you said he he had those couple turnovers, but he seemed to you know bounce back pretty well and really, um, you know, got going toward the end of the half. And uh, it was a pretty good balance for him of of taking open threes, but also attacking the basket. I think it was one of the better jobs he's done in games of really trying to balance where he was trying to score, how he was trying to score. Um, you, you know, just in terms of you know he was he made three of five and three, but he also, you know, made three, um, you know, he was three for three on, uh, on two pointers and then got to the line four times and knocked down three of those. So I thought, um, you know, overall it was a, it was a good balanced performance from him. And, uh, you know, in the, uh, the ongoing quest to figure out who the, you know, the third scorer is going to be, uh, I don't know that it's going to be him that emerges, but I think he showed that, you know, in certain situations, he's going to be able to step up and, and make shots. Um, if he can cut back on the turnovers, uh, all that much better. But I thought he had a pretty good, uh, pretty good game, really start to finish uh, in both halves. And, and again, if Rob's going to be out for any period of time, there's really no uh, no choice but to rely on him, uh, particularly if Zach continues to miss time with the with yeah. the back injury as well. So the yeah, the guard and, and wing depth is uh, is getting you know lesser and lesser by the day. It feels like. Yeah, you know, and, and and if you didn't watch the broadcast, and, and if you didn't see, you know, Zach McRoberts did not dress, was not with the team. His back has apparently, you know, kind of flared up on him again. Uh, Archie did say that Rob was feeling a little bit better, so you know, things sound like maybe they're a little bit encouraging there. But now, obviously, the team has a long layoff, a long break, so you know, we clearly won't get any updates on any of that stuff until. Uh, Indiana's or until Archie uh, Miller's media availability before the Illinois game but yeah I mean Al Durham becomes just an essential piece both he and Devontae Green become essential pieces if you don't have Rob Finnessy if you don't have Zach McRoberts let's talk real quick about Devontae who I thought really came out and didn't play well early on I thought he was forcing shots I thought he was he just didn't quite seem kind of in rhythm and you know when you have a shooting night like he had the night before or the game before you know I understand you know you're, you're feeling a little bit confident but you know this Indiana offense just really struggled when guys settled for long twos and I thought Devontae was doing that early on and he didn't shoot well for the whole game you know he was three for ten but I thought he really kind of improved inside of the game you know he did finish with five assists uh, he had four rebounds so another solid job rebounding from the guard positions two turnovers in 35 minutes is not bad and so I thought he really settled in and started figuring out what was working which is playing through Juwan you know and really attacking getting into the paint and not forcing shots so I was not that pleased with how he played at the beginning of the game like nobody was but I thought he really improved and played better as it went along. And so I don't, you know, I saw, you know, some negative commentary about him. I, I get, you know, being frustrated early on, but I think he, you know, Devontae has been a guy sometimes that if he's not clicking early, struggles to flip the switch back on. And I think one thing we're seeing from him now as a junior is he's getting a little bit better at doing that. And that's what impressed me the most tonight from him. Yeah, I... I definitely thought he he seemed to be hunting shots. And I think even in, in notes that I made, I think I just said, you know, you know, he's trying to do too much early and really forcing things. And I, I would agree with you. I mean, the second half, he only took, I think he only ended up with a couple of shots from the floor versus, you know, he took eight in the first half, just two in the second half. And I thought he really, you know, reined himself in and, and uh, you know, just focused more on getting other guys involved, made a couple of nice shots, got to the free throw line uh, more in the second half than the first. But uh, yeah, I, I just thought early on, he really seemed to, to press to kind of, you know, I don't know if it was to repeat the performance from uh, from Wednesday night, but I don't know, you know, in this game, that's clearly not what they needed from him. Um, and yeah. and really just trying to get the ball to Juwan. I just thought he settled for some shots early that he could get uh, really at any point. And one of the threes he hit in the first half was one of those, like, that's not a good shot, even though it went in. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was definitely a no, 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 yes type of uh <laughs> type of scenario so for you know it was just a, a difficult um you know start for him but I, I agree with you I thought defensively I, I didn't think he was bad um had a few steals and um did some things there also just had to play a ton of minutes uh you know played the entire first half and and really even most of the second half with the game in doubt just because there aren't a lot of other options right now 
uh, in the backcourt. So that's, you know, kind of good for his conditioning as a guy who was really trying to work his way back into things. So that's a positive as well. But yeah, I thought he, he struggled early, but I thought it did enough late that, you know, you could, you could still find some positives in the performance, but um, you know, kind of his start was somewhat emblematic of the slow start that the team had. And as you talk about getting into a much more difficult part of the schedule, um, those are things that, that are going to uh, come back to bite you more in those kinds of games. Yep. All right. Coming up, as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's victory over Jacksonville, I will point out tonight's meaningful moments that you might have missed, and then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from this game. You are listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms, and we are breaking down Indiana's 30-point victory over Jacksonville, a game that featured history with Juwan Morgan recording the second triple-double for uh, in Indiana history. That obviously a moment that everybody paid attention to. But Andy, let's let's point out a few uh, moments that folks might have missed uh, in all the hubbub over Juwan Morgan's uh, triple-double. And you know, there's a great moment in the second half. I thought. Romeo Langford got a long three pointer. He's, you know, probably three or four steps behind the line and drained it. And, you know, he's obviously a guy that has really, you know, has been doing so many things well, but has been struggling with that three point shot. And we saw one of the first Romeo smiles on the court. Like there was a great picture of him after the Butler game celebrating and you saw a smile, but you don't usually see him smile on the court. And you could just see how happy slash relieved he was to see that three pointer go down. Obviously, you know, we hope that that's a harbinger of things to come. You know, ironically, what I, what I really want to point out with Romeo here, though, in the second half isn't necessarily him making a shot, because while I thought that was big, you know, what really stood out to me from him in the second half, again, in a game that was, you know, fairly well decided after the first three or four minutes of the second half, because Indiana really came out and played well. When you're a guy like Romeo, who's expected to score and kind of wired to score, it would have been really easy for him, I think, in a game like that to really start looking for his and start taking it and start forcing some shots. And I was just so impressed that he didn't do that. You know, he had that that great little jump shot uh, off of the little uh, the action with Juwan Morgan on the at the left elbow that he made, and then he was really focused on looking for his teammates. You know, had a couple of assists, didn't force it, and I thought continued to play really hard defense. Again, you know, in a game that's decided against Jacksonville, and so he's just a guy that I continue to be impressed as, as impressed as you are with his physical abilities and his scoring abilities and all of those things. I continue to be impressed with his mentality and how he's bought into being a member of the team and at pretty much all points seeming like a guy who wants to make the best decision for the team. And a one-and-done guy with the kind of hype Romeo has had doesn't always get that. And I've seen some people questioning that, and I absolutely do not understand that because I just haven't gotten a whiff of that from him. And to me, that was kind of – I just saw that in a lot of his play in the second half, and it was impressive. I think you're muted, Andy. I I certainly was. Um, I, he has these he has these stretches each game. It feels like where he just he goes he he a couple possessions in a row will just go and score just to kind of remind you that he's still there and to go in and do it. I think that was one of those toward the end of the first half where he a couple possessions in a row got a I think a dunk on one and a lay in on the other or something where he kind of reminds you like I can do this really whenever I feel like it, but I'm going to get other guys. You know, kind of like you said, get other guys involved. And I, I agree with you. I mean, he only took two shots from the floor. Uh, in the second half and and made both of them. And, you know, again, I thought for him, you know, ended up with 15, a somewhat quiet 15. Maybe I was just too busy paying attention whether Juwan was going to get a triple-double and everybody's <laughs> performance seemed quiet to me. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you notice any points tonight, Andy? I didn't notice. I was watching everything. Yeah. Well, don't watch the ball. Watch everything else. No. Um, so, um, you know, I just thought, you know, he had a couple a couple really nice plays, but just was, you know, solid in a game that, you know, he probably could have could have scored a lot better. Uh, if he wanted to, but I thought they, you know, a lot of the guys did. I mean, you don't end up with, I think they ended up with 21 assists on 35 made baskets. I mean, you don't do that if guys are being, uh, if guys are being too selfish. And I thought, even though he ended up, only ended up with two of those assists, I thought he was a good, um, you know, it, the the attention that he draws. And I think somebody uh, mentioned that in one of the plays in the first half, he just kind of cut toward the rim. The help defender paid attention to him, and then Juwan ends up getting a layup because of it. I, I forget who, um, who tweeted that out. Maybe it was Zach Osterman, but. Uh, it, it 
you know, you just see what a, a, a force he is, just the attention that he draws defensively. And, um, you know, the scoring is obviously great, it's something he can do, but what he opens up for everybody else is something that, you know, when, when he was going to come to IU, that's one of the things everybody said, just how much him being there would open up things for other guys. And I think that's definitely proven to be true. And, and he's certainly shown himself to be pretty unselfish. All five stars tonight were in double figures. Has that happened this season in another game? I can't. I, Think I'm not even sure there's head. been another game when five guys were in double figures, period, let alone let alone the starters. So, yeah, I would not imagine that that's true. That's true. Well, you know, and, and we've talked about all of them but one, and that was Justin Smith. And speaking of meaningful moments you might have missed, there was a three-possession sequence in the second half that was just so – such a microcosm of Justin's offense this season. So, on one possession, he gets a nice little spot-up shot on the baseline set up by one of his teammates. He drains it. The possession after that, he gets the ball on the left wing, kind of in an ISO situation. He tries to drive into the lane, kind of stumbles a little bit, gets blocked, falls over, ball goes to the other end. And then on the next position, possession, it's transition. Juwan made a really great kick-ahead pass. Uh, and, and it was notable, you know, just a little side comment, one of Archie's points of emphasis before the game with Fish was making that kick-ahead pass instead of doing so much dribbling in transition. And I thought we saw Indiana do more of that. And it's always nice to see the team you know, really key in on the things the coach wants to see. But Juwan made this nice kick ahead pass to Justin. He took it, did a nice little step through, and scored. And and you know, again, we've talked about this before. You know, what is Justin doing well when he's playing well offensively? You know, he's cutting to the basket or he's making himself available for a pass from a teammate, which he did to get that spot up jumper. He's getting out in transition, running the floor hard, giving uh, you know his teammates a good angle to get him the pass. He did that with Juwan. What's he doing when he's struggling offensively? Trying to take guys off the dribble, which he did when he got blocked. And so you know, that three possession sequence, it, hopefully he is able to take that and internalize it because if he can do more of the first play and the third play and start to minimize some of what we saw in the second play, he becomes a much more efficient offensive player. To his credit, you know, 13 points, six of seven shooting tonight. I didn't, you know, those numbers look okay. I didn't think overall it was a great game for him because he didn't rebound. Uh, he was a little lackadaisical getting back in transition at times, you know, had some fouls. So he only played 19 minutes and part of that was getting other guys time. Um, uh, but I just thought that particular sequence offensively, it continues to show what he's succeeding with so far this year and what he continues to really struggle with. Yeah. He was really involved a lot early in the second half. Um, he took shots on four of the first six possessions. I think if I'm what I've got written down here was right. And the only shot he missed was the one that, uh, they got blocked, you said, and most of those were just, you know, cutting off of other guys and Juwan being able to find him or, or other guys being able to get him the ball. He had the nice, um, you know, pass from Devante uh, toward the end of the first half. And so, you know, he got a lot of his, you know, that's eight of his points that he got within a, a pretty short time period there. I, I think the only, you know, the big thing that I would point to is the, the zero rebounds because I don't think he had a lot of rebounds on uh, Wednesday night. And it's kind of interesting when he wasn't playing – as well, one of the things that we would always go back to is like, hey, he's been really good rebounding. He's playing solid defense and things like that. So I think his offense is starting to get going now. We just need to you know, marry that up a little bit with the, you know, some of the defense and uh, rebounding components that he had early in the season when he was struggling to, to find shots. But I do think he's settling in a little bit more um, to, to where he can get the ball offensively and, and what kinds of um, what kinds of things he needs to do on that end of the floor to get easy shots, because he's going to get easy shots for the most part if he yeah. uh, if he wants him even the jumper he hit was you know he was just kind of open because other guys were you know getting the defensive attention and it's a decent you know 10 12 foot jump shot that he can make and uh, so I thought overall offensively he was he was solid the rebounding is I, I won't even go so far as to say that it was a concern um, but I do think that's a couple games in a row that he hasn't grabbed as many uh, but otherwise I think he's if nothing else, this stretch for him should be good for his confidence, which I think everybody was pretty concerned about uh, at at points, you know, you know, three weeks ago as to, you know, kind of where his head was from a confidence perspective. One other moment that really stood out to me was Demise Anderson's hustle. There was one play was over on the right wing. It was in the first half and he lost his dribble. He was just trying to do a little bit too much, uh, drove through traffic. But I love seeing that after he lost it, his instinct was just to totally lay out and go after the ball. I mean, it was great hustle. It was Zach McRoberts level. I'm just going to totally give my body up to get this ball. That's nice to see from a young guy like that. Because in a moment like that, you know, you're just playing off of instinct. And some guy's instinct is to reach for the ball. Other guy's instinct is to just dive, you know, all out for it. 
that it was really nice to see that that was what Demise's instinct was. And we're going to talk about him a little bit more uh, here moving forward because he you know, was able to get out there for 15 minutes and I thought did some nice things. Before we get to stats, any other moments stand out to you that we haven't hit yet? Uh, I mean, I just enjoyed seeing Deron Davis out in front of the pack dunking the ball off after that. One, that was awesome. That one series, <laughs> I just thought that was great. I don't think that's one anybody missed because everybody was like, "Wow, how is this happening? How is he in front of everybody?" But that was a uh, that was cool. Plus the fact that he, he had gotten like poked in the eye or something in the first half, and then he was able to come back in. It was like, good lord, don't let anybody else get hurt. So I, th- I thought he looked a little like more athletic tonight. Like jumped a little better, ran a little better. Like he just he looked a little more spry tonight than we've seen in the last few games. I, I just think nice with. Yeah, I mean, I think with with where he is from a rehabilitation standpoint, I, I think there are certain jumps that you might see from guys over the course of the season. But I think with him, it's going to be more exaggerated just in terms of how much more athletic he gets by getting into to game shape because he didn't have the opportunity to do that as much during the uh, during the offseason. So, yeah, I thought that was that was good to see him out there to be able to uh, finish that play and and do that. But other than that, no, uh, n- no big moments stood out. I think the, you know, the lob to Juwan for the, you know, the. Uh, to, to get the triple double was was cool, but that is certainly not one that anybody missed. Uh, okay, let's talk numbers real quick. The most important number, of course, 10, 10, 10, Juwan Morgan stat line. Uh, you mentioned the assists. You know, another really nice job uh, of Indiana moving the ball, 21 assists on 35 made baskets. Uh, that is a really nice rate. And from a three point shooting percentage, Indiana 8 for 20, 40% again. So, you know, here we are. I know that. You know, Indiana doesn't have a lot of individual shooters that strike fear in you. And I think if you ask, you know, general Indiana fan, is this a good shooting team? They'd probably say like, eh, or they might even just say no. But here we are, you know, after 13 games, you know, all the non-conference schedule completed, Indiana is top 100 in the country in three-point shooting. And I just want to continue to point that out. And that is in part because I think what Indiana does well is they compensate for not having a lot of great individual shot makers and like prolific three-point shooters by being, for the most part, judicious with the threes that they shoot so that they have a higher percentage of making them. You know, a lot of catch-and-shoot opportunities, a lot of open threes. They don't force a lot, and they do that and then are able to be efficient with it. It makes the three-pointer a useful weapon for them, not you know, the kind of weapon for a team that's going to take a ton of them, but useful in the way that they deploy it. And so I continue to be impressed and encouraged by that. And I think we've seen enough now, you know, it feels like something that we'll be able to sustain and carry into Big Ten play. Maybe not at quite this rate, but still something that will be a positive for them. Uh, What other numbers for you, Andy, stood out? Uh, you know, 50 points in the paint. That's been a big emphasis as well. I mean, you talked about the three point shooting. The flip side of that is, you know, really, really trying to attack and uh, get points in the paint. You know, some of those on, uh, you know, dribbling the ball inside, but others just created by opportunities. Guys like Juwan and, and making passes, guys cutting toward the basket. So 50 points in the paint uh, is a big one. Just 12 turnovers, a couple offensive foul uh, turnovers that, that was there in the second half, but just five in the first half when, you know, things were really, uh, in doubt. So that's a good, uh, that's certainly a good number. Probably could have easily been single digits with a, you know, if a couple, a couple plays went differently. Um, that was there. We talked about the assist. That was for me, that was a big one. Free throw shooting was still not good. Uh, 16 of 26. I think maybe the first four trips to the line, they split. Um, and then, and then whoever took the last couple of the half, um, made both might've been Al. Um, so ended up, you know, 16 of 26 on the day, not a huge deal in a game like this, a really good free throw rate, 26 free throw attempts compared to 54 field goal attempts. But when you're only going to make, you know, just a little bit over 60% of them, uh, that is not great. Bench points had 25, which is Jacksonville. Interestingly enough, brings their leading scorer off the bench. So they, I, you still managed to outscore them in, in bench points. Uh, even though that guy, uh, Note had, had 15, um, as you said, five guys in double figures, six guys with at least nine points. Uh, was a was a big one uh, and then on the defensive end just in terms of activity type stats you know seven blocks six steals um, both of those are, are good numbers they forced 13 turnovers and, and they kind of did to Jacksonville at times like what IU uh, had been prone to at other points you know when the game really started to get away from Jacksonville early in the second half they turned the ball over four times in a row so one of those where you, you know things can kind of snowball and I thought that their their defense um, you know did was pretty disruptive uh, for the most part, and uh, and held uh, Jacksonville to three of 13 from three-point range, and they hit two in a row at one point in the first half as part of that run to build the lead. So they really, I think, only hit one over the last, you know, I'll say fifth or you know, 35, you know, 33, 35 minutes of the game. 
you know, uh, one other number that's interesting is Indiana only had three offensive rebounds. And I've been asked a lot over the past few weeks about our lack of offensive rebounding this season. What I would say is, number one, we don't miss a whole lot of shots. <laughs> so our volume of offensive rebounds isn't going to tend to be that high. But from a percentage standpoint, Indiana's offensive rebounding percentage coming into this game was 26.9%. That's 231st in the country. That's not real good. You know, last year, this was more of a strength for Indiana, 30, 31.8%. And I think you kind of had to have that. That wasn't a great shooting team. You had a guy like Freddie McSwain, who you could really maximize his skills as an offensive rebounder. And so I think, you know, when you see those the three offensive rebounds, you can be concerned about it. But you add in the shooting, and then you add in that Archie Miller's biggest emphasis coming into this game, the first one he mentioned to Fish on the pregame show was transition defense. You know, didn't like Indiana's transition defense against Central Arkansas. Archie is a guy who you look back at his teams at Dayton, they never really had real high offensive rebounding rates, or they, they traditionally didn't. Maybe there was an outlier season here or there. Archie likes his guys to get back, get in position defensively, don't give up the easy bucket in transition, and one of the trade-offs there is offensive rebounds. So, you know, I know that number can stick out like a sore thumb, especially when Jacksonville gets 11 offensive rebounds. And, you know, I think Indiana's going to need to shore up its defensive rebounding a little bit. But that's kind of the explanation for why that is on the offensive end, Andy. Do, do you have any any concerns about the offensive rebounding numbers at all? Or is that just the trade-off Indiana's going to have to play this system and style that Archie Miller wants? No, I think to me, when you go and you look at teams that really play the pack line, you know, Virginia is kind of your textbook example if you will they really have been consistent if you look across their history and in, in offensive rebounding percentage and they've typically been outside the top 200 i think they're 140th this year um but they've typically not not hammered the offensive glass and wisconsin is another fairly extreme uh example where they basically just don't go after offensive rebounds at all so theirs even this year is is particularly low so i think you see that with a lot of pack line teams where you're really trying to prevent um, you know, prevent transition opportunities. And that's an area that really, I feel like since the beginning of the season, Archie has mentioned as a weakness, as a focus area uh, in terms of really being able to, uh, you know, stop transition, not get guys out of rotation, being able to find shooters and things like that. And to the extent that IU shooting the, you know, getting the ball inside a lot, hopefully you're not missing a lot of shots around the basket, which so far IU has not. Um, and then otherwise you're really just trying to get back on defense. So I don't know that it's a huge concern. I agree with you. I think last year's team, it was a, it was kind of a, like, we need to do whatever the hell we can to try to find a way to score baskets. <laughs> yeah. And if that means I'm going to go hammer the offensive glass and that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I don't think that's as necessary for this year's team. Uh, although, you know, as big 10 play heats up, maybe that changes a little bit, but, um, I do think there's something to the fact that a lot of teams that play the pack line tend to, to rank lower uh, in offensive rebound position or offensive rebound percentage. Yep. Okay, coming up on the assembly call, we continue our breakdown of Indiana's victory over Jacksonville. We're going to have some time to talk about some of the guys at the back end of the rotation, Jake Forrester, Clifton Moore, Demise Anderson. Talk about them, our observations next on the assembly call. Stick with us. Listening to the Assembly Call IU postgame show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure that you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 6,000 of your fellow IU fans are subscribed. It will make you a smarter and more well informed IU basketball fan. I am Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, and we are breaking down Indiana's victory over Jacksonville. Uh, Andy, we have a listener question that just came in. So, uh, what do you take away from tonight? So that that I don't like Ryan. the sound of that guy's voice. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, I don't like his tone. Not even <laughs> that's because usually he's jumping in to interrupt something that you're saying. Yeah, right? you should have played that while I was already talking, and then it really would have felt it made it feel more lifelike. Um. So, you know, Ryan, we've, we've talked about some things that we've taken away from tonight. Uh, you know, one of the things about a game like this, Andy, is you know we have some time here to, to actually talk about guys like Demise Anderson, Jake Forrester, and, and and Clifton Moore, which we don't often do. Um, and we should talk about Evan Fitzner as well, because he obviously got in there and got some minutes. But I want to spend a little bit of time on Demise Anderson. Obviously pressed into additional duty with no Rob Finnessy, with no uh, Zach McRoberts in the game. And 
you know, as it usually is when Demisi is out there right now, it was a mixed bag. We saw the shooting that we all know he possesses, three or five from downtown. He, you know, he rebounded, um, but had a couple of turnovers, was out of position on defense. I mean, it was kind of what you would expect from Demisi, but I thought overall a solid performance from him. The thing that does impress me about him, like the the impression that I get from Demisi is that his instinct every time he touches the ball is to shoot or drive, just like find some way to score. Like that just seems the way that he's wired. And I I feel like kind of as the season gone, has gone along and we've seen him get some more minutes in these games, you know, he's kind of curtailed that. And I can't, I, off the top of my head of his six shots, I can't think of any of them that weren't good shots. You know, they were pretty much all in the offense. He didn't really force the issue. He seems to be a guy that is, you know, learning and improving. And 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 he was on, he was actually the uh the the player guest on on Don Fisher's pregame show. And he talked about how, you know, it's been a hard transition because he's always been the best player on his team, always been a guy who's been expected to score, and he's had to find other ways to contribute and figure out another role. And I think his ability to do that to me was on display tonight. I thought these were some of his best minutes. Um, and so, again, you, you're not. He, I don't think he's going to be a guy you're going to want to count on too much in Big Ten play. But it's at least nice to know that when he gets in there, it seems like he's going to try and, and not go outside of the offense. And when he does get shots, we obviously know that he can knock him down. Yeah, I thought right after he came in the game, this was it, it reminds me a little bit of what you said about Justin Smith. In a very short stretch of time, like I think you kind of, saw it had the whole experience where he came in i thought he played had a really you know was really intent defensively when he came in during the first possession that he was uh that he was out there ends up getting the defensive rebound i think makes a three on the other end of the floor and then the next possession you know bites hard on a shot fake and the guy drives around him for a layup and i was like oh, that seems about you know yeah. it's just kind of where he is right now and, and and um but he had those couple threes right in a row from basically the same spot on the floor in the second half uh and i I agree with you for the most part. I think the two pointer that he missed was kind of a, a force, um, a, you know, off the dribble. But but generally speaking, you can tell. Oh he, yeah, that, it was. It was a long yeah. two. You're right. You, I mean, you can tell that he's a guy who wants to shoot and and is is kind of wired to to shoot and score. Um, but I do think you've seen him, you know, kind of rein it in. And I think in a game where the margin is what what it was in this game, I think it's even harder for a guy like that to not just be like, you know what, I'm going to go. And that's what the two-pointer felt like to me in that situation was like, well, everything's going right. I'm going to take the shot. Um, but I do think you've seen growth from him. And in in a particular role, um, I, I think he can he's going to have some some key minutes in, in Big Ten games. If people are really packing it in and trying to, you know, take things away from Juwan. He's certainly shown he's a good enough passer to get to get the ball to him. And then it's just a matter of can you get him up to a, you know, an adequate level defensively where he's, you know, not not hurting you too much on that end of the floor. But, you know, I, I think it's interesting and I didn't hear the interview that you said, but one of the things that has struck me really since the beginning in any of the media availability and things like that, that he's been there, like he seems to be pretty self-aware and, and pretty candid yeah. about what he does well and what he's struggling with and things like that. I think that's a good quality to have. He doesn't there are certainly guys who who you'd say the same things about, like always been the best player on the team, always been able to score whenever they wanted. Um, that I, you know, there certainly are guys who would not be able to come out and say, "Hey, that that's a struggle for me." Um, but I think being aware of it is going to allow him to adjust and, and be successful over the course of his career. So I think that's a positive, and um, you know, good minutes for him tonight. Again, you don't know how long uh, Rob and Zach are going to be out, but at the very least, you're going to need to you know have him spell guys for a few minutes here and there, and. Um, I think he's starting to show, you know, sort of some confidence there. And I think it was one of those where it had been a while since he scored. I think they said his first basket since so sometime in November. It, you know, if he's going to be forced into those kinds of minutes in early in Big Ten play, that's intimidating enough, let alone when you haven't scored in, in a month. So, yeah. uh, you know, good to get him a little confidence and, and go back to that. And, and like I said, I think there's going to be games where he might knock down a, a couple of big shots that we'll look back at after the game and really talk about being, a, uh, you know, key plays. Jake Forrester got five minutes, scored seven points in those five minutes. Quick pop quiz that using context clues, I have a feeling you'll be able to answer. Who leads Indiana in percentage of possessions used on the season? <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say Jake Forrester. <laughs> Jake Forrester, who's using 33.9% of possessions when he's on the floor. I will say this about Jake Forrester. He does not get cheated when he is on the floor. He gets in there and his teammates look for him and he's looking to do stuff offensively. And, you know, I saw this coming on Twitter when he's out there. It's it is easy to see like the highlight plays, you know, to see him score and be active and get to the free throw line and do all of these things, you know, get a block shot and think, okay, well, he needs to be on the floor. He needs to be playing more. 
But I will tell you right now, my prediction, if we were able to be in the film room, is that if we could see which moment would make Archie the most irate, there was a moment late while, while Jake was in there when I think he missed a shot and he just turned and totally lollygagged it back down the court and his man beat him in transition and scored a bucket. I have a feeling that's going to draw the ire of his coach. Those are the kinds of things that will keep him off the court, along with not getting a rebound during his time when he's in there, because Jake is a guy who's going to need to rebound. So, you know, kind of like we talked about with Clifton in the Penn State game, some stuff to like, some stuff to build on. And you know that if he does get forced into action, he's going to be a guy who's active, you know, can present a body down low that might be able to score and get you some buckets. But some of those breakdowns for a team that wants its identity to be rock solid defense and in a defensive system that really relies on all guys being on the same page, you know, in these these minutes that Jake and Clifton and, and Demisi are getting, you're seeing the upside, you're seeing the highlights, but if you watch closely, you also see the reasons why they're not playing. And so, I, you know, I think it's important to point those out just to make sure that everybody's expectations for playing time and, you know, the decisions that the coaches are making, if anyone's questioning those, which... Let's remember, as Ryan likes to say, you know, the, the coaches know these teams better than we do. If we ever forget that, we're fools. Um, but, you know, I, I just thought we saw that mixed bag from Jake, as you would expect from these guys as freshmen that are still kind of feeling their way through their first minutes of action out there on the court. Yeah, I think a lot of it is the same that we you were talked about the other night, really active. And I think in the kinds of games that these last two have been where things are really, you know, out of control. I think just being act being big and active on the, on the offensive end is going to, you know, you're going to walk your way into some, into some baskets. And so I thought he was, uh, you know, exactly that. I think, you know, now he made his first two free throws, which I think made everybody probably extra excited. And then, you know, you know, made one of his, his last threes, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. It, it's, because you also have to figure out like, who are you playing him over at that point? And it, it's not just, Hey, in these minutes, he's doing that. I want him to get more minutes. Well, somebody else is not going to get those minutes and you got to figure out who that's going to be and look at really the entire picture, as you said, where I think he could go in and do similar things to what Clifton Moore did at the Penn state game, kind of get some, you know, you know, clean up, clean up some things around the rim, um, you know, get some baskets that way and, and, and kind of really be, be active and flying around on the court. Flip side is you're going to probably give up some points on the other end of the floor, but I, and it's another one of those where it gives you a glimpse of, hey, this guy in this system for multiple years with his just natural athletic ability and energy level can be a really, really valuable player for a long time. I just don't know that that time is is right now. Um, but these types of experiences, getting these guys on the court for, you know, those kinds of minutes are really invaluable to try to get that and get some things on film for them to learn from as well. Um, so yeah, it's certainly a positive you take away from a game like this. Uh, by the way, you mentioned earlier, I think it was Demisi getting uh, getting pump faked and running by the guy. I, I will say, going back to our conversation about Devontae Green, one thing he did not do well tonight was approach shooters and be disciplined with shot fakes. I think there must have been three or four times that he just ran right by a guy. Obviously, it didn't hurt us in a game like this, but that's uh, that's something he's going to need to clean up. Did you take anything from Evan Fitzner's minutes tonight? He had three points, uh, did not make a couple of really good looks from three-point range had a few rebounds seemed like he had some opportunities down low that if he had caught the ball cleanly, uh, you know, probably could have converted into points a little bit easier, but um, you know, any, anything to take from Evan's minutes? Not too much. I do think, you know, you worry and we've talked about this a little bit just from a, a confidence standpoint where he's, you know, where he's at. I think he draws a lot of confidence from really being able to step out and knock down threes. As you said, the couple he got in this game were, uh, were clean looks that he missed. So it was good to see good to see him grab a few rebounds because I know there's one thing we talked about. He seemed to be kind of struggling to grab the ball in traffic. So I thought he did a little bit better on that side of things. But I do think as you go through some of these other games and you see him, if he's not able to, you know, really start making shots, um, it, it makes you a little bit concerned. Does he start to, you know, lose confidence in that a little bit, which is really the the main thing he's being asked to do on this team to really space the floor. All right. So we've gotten through a lot. We the game ball segment tonight is going to be really short, I think. <laughs> pretty, seems, seems right. Pretty obvious choice. Let, let's spend a few minutes here and just talk macro. Uh, you know, the, the Ken Palm numbers just updated. Indiana's still sitting right there at 23rd, which is kind of where we've been. Um, you know, obviously, you, you win a game over the 292nd team in the country. Unless you beat them by 80 points, you're probably not going to move up very much. Indiana essentially just took care of business. And you know, I think that was the nice thing about these last two games against Jacksonville and Arkansas. After what happened against UT Arlington and UC Davis, where you know you're shorthanded, those games are much closer than you want them to be. 
Indiana really did a nice job after that four game win streak and the elation of the Butler win, you know, coming back down to earth and just getting down to business and getting, you know, getting done what they needed to get done against Central Arkansas and Jacksonville. And so now they head into Big Ten play. They got this nice break. I think they're going to be off until the 27th when they practice again. Sitting at 11 and 2, you know, will be in the top 25 for the third straight week in about as good of a position here heading into Big Ten play as I think before the season started that you could have predicted. And that's even with everybody healthy. You know, given the context of all the injuries, I think you got to be pretty ecstatic with where this team is after 13 games. Yeah, I, I think if you had let people, you know, if you'd said, hey, I'm going to give you 11 and two uh, coming out of this stretch, I think everybody would have would have taken it and and been pretty excited about it. Again, I think, you know, the Duke loss felt like a given uh, really from the get go once you saw them play and, and how good they were. And then I think when you look at the other games on the schedule, I think you had to reasonably believe that they're going to drop one or two of those others. Now, if if you ranked them in the order in which you might drop them, would it, the Arkansas game have floated to the top? Certainly not. Um, and Arkansas hasn't played as well of late, which is uh, which is not ideal. But uh, but Marquette, on the other hand, has started to play much better. So that win you know looks better and better. Uh, as you move forward, so but that that defensive performance just looks incredible. Yeah, yeah every time we see Marcus <laughs> Howard like lighting everybody up for forty five, they're like, man, I you really did a number on him. So, uh, yeah, some of that even in retrospect looks even better than than you thought it would. So I think you know to be eleven and two, uh, it, it's hard to be anything but but excited about uh, what this team can be. And it, it's at some point though, you're you know thirteen games into a season where you've got you know thirty thirty one I think um, regular games on the schedule. Uh, at some point, the the notion of like, I'm really excited to see this team, what this team can be when it's at full strength, maybe one that we just need to abandon at some point. I think <laughs> I think that, you know, I think Jerome Hunter from that perspective, I think everybody's kind of moved on from that. But I think we keep talking about all these other things. And it's like, I'm not sure if it may just not be in the cards for this team to ever be at full strength. But that being full said, full strength is just having eight guys who can play. That's well, full strength. All right. Well, then then we're. <laughs> Barely clinging to that at this point, but that's good. Um, but you know, I think I think given all the injuries, I think the eleven and two looks that much more impressive, quite frankly. Um, and yeah. and so you you can't help but feel good about that. Uh, and I think you know, with you've seen improvement in guys over the course of the season, and um, you know, the Big Ten I think is going to be much more difficult than than people may have thought. Uh, early and I think it makes it really important to get that Illinois game to to move to three and zero before things really get uh, get difficult and get interesting there. But uh, like I said, I think if you had offered everybody up to be eleven and two uh, at the end of the calendar year based on the schedule and and what they had, I think you'd be hard pressed to find people that wouldn't take it. And I think in some ways, being eleven and two, given the injuries and given some of the other things, um, actually probably feels better than you even might think it would as if 11 and two in and of itself wasn't good enough. So certainly things to, to worry about. You have to think maybe some of the, you know, close game winning every single one of those may, uh, or I guess all but all but one, um, you know, may catch up with you at some point, but I think the execution late in games has been, uh, has been good. I think that's been kind of a constant makes you maybe, maybe calm some of those fears a little bit. Yep. All right. Coming up here in our final segment, we hand out our game ball. And I have some incredible numbers about Jawan Morgan that we'll talk about. We hit a few other storylines. And then in the last call, we will deliver our final thoughts on Indiana's victory over Jacksonville. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. You are listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I am Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, and we are wrapping up Indiana's victory over Jacksonville, which concluded the non-conference portion of the schedule. The Hoosiers 11 and 2 heading into Big Ten play. Of course, with the two Big Ten wins already in their back pocket. Andy, this is the time in the show when we hand out our game ball coming into tonight. Jawan and Romeo each had four game balls. Deron Davis had earned two of them. Rob Finnessy and Devontae Green each with one. I have a feeling the tie at the top is going to be broken. Well, I think we should really spend a lot of time hashing this one out to uh, really come to a consensus on who the player of the game really was tonight. And I mean, I think this one is as easy as as there has been um, over the course of the season. You know, Jawan... 
you know, certainly the triple double, I mean, those, you know, some of that is just, you know, numbers and that sounds, that sounds exciting, but I mean, to really look and see what he did and how he impacted the game offensively with his passing. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the tennis really do it justice. Even in that case, it was just, he was such a focal point proved early in the game. If they were going to give him the ball and not double team him, he could score whenever he wanted. Then they started to make things a little bit more difficult there. And he was a guy who consistently found other guys. Jacksonville played zone for a little bit. They stick Juwan in the middle. He's just slinging the ball around to whoever is is open and um, and credit to the guys on the other end of those passes for making shots. But I just thought he was uh, he was fantastic and, uh, you know, just really helped erase any doubt in the game pretty early on. Uh, and really, like I said, at a certain point, the only drama was whether or not he'd get the triple double. So I think well deserving of the of the game ball and breaking the tie. Or, you know, if Ryan's prophecy, or maybe not prophecy, but what he talked about after the Central Arkansas game where, you know, after after a game like Butler, they should have just given Juwan a hot tub and a cigar to just sit over there on the sidelines and watch the game. I was kind of hoping they would do that after he went out with you know six minutes left because <laughs> he uh, he certainly earned it after that performance and what he's done for this team this year. Um, numbers wise, look, the numbers for Juwan right now are getting insane. He is on two point field goals. He's 75.8%, which is seventh in the country. I have a feeling that the people who are above him have not taken almost 102 point field goals this season. Uh, he's still in the top 100 in the country with his three point shooting 46.4%, but he's, you know, he's not forcing them. You know, that's the thing about his three point shooting is he's taken a lot more threes against Indiana's better competition, but he doesn't. Like, he doesn't just get comfortable in these games where he could, you know, just kind of stand outside and shoot threes. I mean, he got the ball down low and 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 didn't force shots down there either. You know, took five shots, made five shots. His effective field goal percentage, 74.4%. That is sixth in the country. Uh, and he's also, you know, his rebounding rates are really good. His block percentage of 5.5 is outstanding. Uh, and his offensive efficiency, 128, uh, is in the top 100 in the country. So, I mean, he is doing absolutely everything that he could do for this team. I wholeheartedly agree, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, with Jess Settles that he's among the top contenders for Big Ten Player of the Year right now. It's still very early, uh, and that it was an absolute ridiculous snub that he didn't make that midseason watch list. But look, midseason watch lists don't mean anything. So hopefully he saw that, got mad, uses it as motivation, and all that matters is that he's there by the end of the season. And if he keeps this up, he will be. The other thing I think about this team that we are seeing – as they kind of grow together, Andy, is this is a really unselfish team. You know, we're seeing the assist rate numbers be better. And and, and I just feel, and you know, part of this is, you know, there were new parts and pieces. There's been injuries, so it's been hard for the chemistry to develop. But I think as we're seeing it develop, you know, outside of some times when I think guys, you know, maybe take a three-pointer early in the shot clock or take a long two, I, I – I just I feel like there's a real unselfish vibe on this team, and I think it it stems from the fact that the team's two stars, Juwan Morgan and Romeo Langford, are clearly committed to unselfish play, and that makes them fun to watch. You know, I I even feel like some of the bad shots they take are more just just kind of bad shot selection, not necessarily selfish, but just thinking a shot is a good one when it's not. And I really appreciate watching a team that seems unselfish and seems to really want the next guy to succeed. And I get that feeling, and I attribute a lot of that to the example that Juwan and Romeo set. Yeah, just one thing. So I did look up the two-point percentage of the guys who were in front of him. So uh, only two of the other guys of the of the six in front of him have taken more than 56 shots from the floor. So uh, Taco Fall, the guy who's 7'6 on Central Florida, <laughs> is 56 of 70. Look, if you're 7'6, you better, you better be 80% from two-point range. And then uh, the other one is Tristan <laughs> Tristan Clark of Baylor. He's 6'9". He's 62 of 79. So, uh, yeah, but otherwise, it's guy guys who's in the 70, 50s or 42. Yeah, you're 7'6". Yeah, if you – yeah, good good for you. Yeah, it's almost – Juwan's almost the inverse. He's, like, really 6'7 as opposed to 7'6". So. Anyway, uh, but, no, I agree with you on the, on the assist. I think – you know, Juwan playing the way he does. You, know, we mentioned this with Romeo about how he really, it would have been an easy game to go and get his and really focus on playing that way. Um, and he didn't do it. And I think we've seen that. I think that's one been one of the criticisms of him. Maybe he's not selfish enough. Um, but I think Juwan, just the passing numbers, they showed it during the uh, during the broadcast where they, you know, kind of showed his assist rate over the course of his career, and it's really skyrocketed. I'm sure it's even higher than I think it was like 17 percent when they showed it on there. It's certainly much higher now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just 20.6 now that's, that's not bad. That's what a 10 assist game will do for you. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I do think that's important because, 
uh, on a team with with two really defined stars, that's important. But I think knowing as their teammates that they trust other guys to be able to make shots and they're not going to force shots in, you know, in in double covered situations and they're going to kick out to the open guys. Uh, if the if the open guys can continue to make shots at the rate that they have, as you said, a lot of the three pointers are catch and shoot off of scenarios like that. Um, I think that really bodes well for IU, but I think that level of uh, unselfishness makes it easy for there not to kind of become any kind of, you know, division between, hey, here's the stars of the team and everybody else. And that was really one of the things that everybody said for, about Romeo from the get-go, that he wasn't the typical five-star guy who wanted to go get his, and he wanted to be part of the team and, and do that. And so I think, yeah, the assist numbers have been really good uh, in these last couple of games, and I think that's a reflection of the uh, unselfishness they've shown. So quick programming note, we will not have Banner Monday this Monday. It is Christmas Eve, so we'll be taking that one off. We haven't decided yet if we're going to do it on New Year's Eve, but we're definitely not going to be doing it on Christmas Eve. So our next broadcast will be Thursday, Assembly Call Radio, uh, December 27th. That's the first time that we'll be back. So no Banner mornings during that time either. We're going to take a few days off, just like the team, uh, kind of get away from it. But then uh, you know we'll be back with our normal schedule. Uh, Much once. like the team, the NCAA has mandated that we take this time off. So we, <laughs> yeah. who, are, who are we to uh, stand up to such a, an a upstanding organization as the NCAA? Absolutely. I respect whatever rulings the NCAA hands down, and, and we will follow them accordingly. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what we're doing schedule wise. Anything else from this game, Andy, that we, uh, that we haven't hit. I feel like we've covered most of the major. I think we've, I think we've, I think we've done our part to <laughs> can, cover. Can cover we squeeze anything else out of this 30 point blowout? Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. I do think we're good. All right. Uh, you're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 15% off your entire order at HoosierProud.com and at HomeFieldApparel.com. So if you want officially licensed IU gear, go to HomeFieldApparel.com. And if you want one of our Assembly Call logo t-shirts or one of Hoosier Proud's unique Indiana-inspired designs, visit HoosierProud.com. And on both sites, use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout, and you will get 15% off your entire order. All right, well, we can get out of here a little bit early tonight, Andy. Let's uh, let's head to last call and be on our way to celebrate the Christmas holiday. Absolutely. Well, I, I think, you know, again, I it, probably the best way to circle back is to the, you know, the fact that I use 11 and 2. And, and it's, uh, you know, they have very few of them have been easy uh, and have felt great. But if you look back through 13 games a season ago, it was 7 and 6. So uh, I, I think a... Four game improvement on that is is well earned by this team, and uh, I'm really excited to see what they can be down the stretch because I think uh, there's a lot of things to like about them. They've continued to play well defensively. The growth that that was seen defensively a year ago has really kept up that momentum over the course of the the first part of this year. And I think if that can continue in the Big Ten, you're going to find yourself in a lot of games. And I'll take my chances with guys like Juwan Morgan and Romeo Langford leading the way offensively in close games. Uh, in addition to how well Archie has fared in those uh, over the course of his career that's been brought up um, this month with so many close games and, and just how this team has played in those games before. So I think a really positive non-conference season plus those couple Big Ten games uh, over the course of it. I don't think, uh, you know, you never know before you've seen a team play how things are going to play out. Uh, we may have predicted 11-2 and two records, but as I said, I don't think they got there uh, in any in any way, shape, or form in the way that we thought that they would uh, just in terms of who's playing what roles, the injuries, and all those kinds of things. But uh but certainly a, a positive for IU and, and something that fans should be excited about as we head into a, a little bit of a break and get ready for the part that's going to be, uh, you know, as for as many things that seemed hard, it's kind of like, all right, well, now take a, take a breath, exhale, and then the hard part really gets started uh, in early January when Big Ten play starts. But uh, certainly exciting for them and, uh, you know, and, and from my perspective, happy holidays and Merry Christmas to everybody with the show. Enjoy some time off with your family. And uh, I thought what Jared said about Terry Hutchins was really well said. Uh, at the beginning that that post that Alex has um, it is not hard on inside the hall it is not hard to see the common threads um, of of what he's done and what he's meant to a lot of people and and in the industry and, and students and things like that and uh, I think any of us would be lucky to have people say things like are being said about Terry Hutchins after we are after we are gone so certainly lost him too soon but uh, you know rest in peace to him uh, and his family during what's sure to be a difficult holiday time for them absolutely you know Look, I, th I think we'd all love to have a few more blowout victories. We'd certainly love to have more guys healthy. Um, but I, I think when you look at how the first 13 games of this season went, you know, we've got a team that has dealt with adversity. That is for sure. And has been put in different situations. And they've come out in most of those situations and, and they've been successful. And so I think you, 
you have to be happy with where this team is at right now, given kind of the context of how everything has gone this season. I know that I am, uh, and I'm, I'm excited for this little break, but I'm really excited to get back and see this team play. You know, Andy, when we kind of do what we do, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, there, there have certainly been some seasons where you're just you're looking forward to the next game and the next post-game show and the next opportunity to talk about them and break them down and learn something new about the team. And then there are other seasons where you're just kind of dreading it. <laughs> it's like, all right, well, we got to, wa- you know, we're going to watch the game because you root for the team, but, you know, your hopes for seeing something new or for really seeing growth aren't really there. And I think with this team, I'm just, I'm really excited to get back and watch them play against Illinois. And it's fun having two players like Juwan and Romeo that are so good, that are so talented, that do so many things well, and that really seem to be team first guys. And then to see everybody kind of falling in line around them. And to see kind of with each game and each week, even though every now and then there's a step back, you get a couple steps forward in this new system and identity that Archie Miller is building. And no coach is going to be able to you know, have that fully installed in less than two years, and certainly Archie doesn't either. But you really see it, and I like the identity that this program is taking. I like the kind of basketball that they're playing. I like the things that they stand for, the things that they're about. And that makes it fun to show up every game to watch them and to show up every show to talk about them uh, for you guys. So really excited to take a break, but just as excited to get back and see what this team has in store for us against Illinois and then for that really tough stretch in January. But I feel good. Most nights we're going to have the two best uh, players on the floor, uh, and that gives you a chance to win every night out. And when you play defense like Indiana can, and for the most part does, that's going to keep you in games. And I think those two things combined are going to make this a really fun, entertaining, interesting, and hopefully successful Big Ten season for the Hoosiers. All righty, well, that will do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat and join the chat mob, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening to the show. We'll be back for Assembly Call Radio on Thursday. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. Go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. Rest in peace, Hutch. All right. <clears throat> Thank you to everybody who was here. You, you know, you know, one reason why I like the December games against like the, you know, the 300 level teams, we really find out who the diehards are. <laughs> you really find out who the diehards are. Not to cast aspersions on the people who aren't here. Coach is a diehard. Several people who aren't here. I know people have things that they're doing. But to those of you who are here, game like this in December, we appreciate you. It is awesome seeing you all here. I saw some uh, some conjecture in the chat about how we should make Ryan do the next Assembly uh, B- uh, Banner Monday show by himself. And then people started to wonder what a Ryan-only show would be. We've That's all a, done solo shows, actually. I've done a solo show. You have. Michael yeah. Dugan's done one. Ryan never has. I mean, number one, the show would never start because he wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> but it would yeah, be I mean, entertaining. Somebody's got to be there to record it. So that's going to be yeah. problem number one. But uh, yeah, that feels like a dangerous recipe. I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure whether I'm, everybody's ready for that quite yet. I mean, I don't foresee him having an issue filling time. That's no, for sure. No. But just no, getting the show not. launched and getting something that people could listen to. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be the issue <laughs> yeah once he gets going it's fine it's the the starting yeah <laughs> yeah uh yeah, well oh maybe they didn't suggest banner monday maybe they wanted it to be a post game show i don't know yeah can't uh, wait the, the time for experiments like that would, would have been a game like this but yeah now that you get <laughs> yes. in a big 10 play you can't go uh yeah no. you can't try that you can't try those kinds of plays <laughs> in that situation yeah no you can't you definitely can't all right, man. Well, hey, uh, happy holidays to you. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you too, man. Are you uh, yeah. are you guys hitting the road soon? Or are you staying around town? Uh, we're here through Christmas, and then we'll be uh, we'll head to Indiana after for a few days. Yeah, so that's why I can't. That's why I can't be on Thursday. I'll be in a house full of people. So nice. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll be there, and then we'll be back here for before New Year's. So cool. Yeah, we're heading out tomorrow to go down and visit Heather's family. So get this all wrapped up, get some sleep, and be ready for them. Be ready for the madness. Absolutely. Enjoy it. Enjoy cool, man. It. You too. Wish. Uh, and, oh, and the girls things, they should be coming. They should get their Christmas Eve. The first okay. boxes. So if they right. don't show up, let me know. They should be their Christmas Eve. All right. Well, I'm I'm told that that uh, the second thing 
that I, well, the second uh, go round at what I ordered for you should be there on Monday. So we'll see if, if nothing else, it'll bleed into later in the week and just, you know, lengthen the holiday season. Yeah. You extend it. You have another present to open later. That's perfect. It's a perfect. good way to do it. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Well, cool, appreciate man. it. Thanks. Yep. Thanks everybody for uh, tuning in on a Saturday night before Christmas and, uh, and uh, enjoy your time off. Everybody hopefully has at least a little bit and uh, enjoy your time with your family. Yep. See you everybody. We'll talk to you guys on Thursday.